All right, I think let's get started. It seems like a lot of people are already on. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Mesa Alami. Um, I work on research and advocacy with um, the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy or our digital brand uh, Rabbit. We are a Ramallah-based uh, NGO and we work on, um, leave, uh, on uh, Palestinian human rights and um, spreading the Palestinian narrative and uh, we're here joined today hosting this event with PSC, um, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign from uh, the UK. So the point of this um, event is one, to share with you the release of our uh, latest documentary uh, called Colonial Economy, which talks about uh, the experience of Palestinian workers in Israel and in Israeli settlements and the ways in which their rights are violated and how the occupation and the apartheid system under which they live um, dictates the economy um, that they are working under and living under and that basically dictates their quality of life and um, their work conditions, uh, which are often very inhumane um, and very difficult. And the whole point today is that we're joined with amazing uh, speakers who will also create the narrative for solidarity, global solidarity with uh, Palestinian workers um, around the world um, and share their experiences with us. So let me start by introducing um, our speakers. First, we have Luis uh, Reagan, who is the vice chair of PSC uh, UK and also a national officer um, of the National Education Union, the NEU um, in the UK. And then uh, we're also joined by Mariela Cohon, who is the Senior International Officer of the Trades Union Congress, the TUC, which represents over 5.5 million workers in Britain. Um, prior, prior to joining uh, the TUC, Mariela also worked on human and trade union rights in Cambodia, uh, Colombia for many years and was involved as um, an advisor to the Colombian peace process. So it's gonna be great to have Mariela uh, tell us a little bit more about her background and that, how that um, intersects with Palestinian workers' human rights. And last but not least, we have uh, Manal Shkher, who's, an inter uh, who's the International Outreach Coordinator of the Land Defense Coalition, an umbrella of grassroots organizations of which the Palestine New Federation of Trade Unions is a member. Um, so Manal is also going to give us a great perspective into uh, sort of trade unions, labor rights, um, as well as um, just cross-sectional uh, solidarity um, globally. So yeah, we're very excited to have you on board. Um, I ask that you please, um, in the comment section, um, if you wanna share your background, where you're from, where you're joining us from, please do so. It would be great to create connections in the chat box, but I ask that we keep it respectful. And um, uh, if you have any questions as well, please do put the questions in there. We're going to be um, monitoring the questions as, you, as, as we continue the conversation. And towards the end of the documentary, uh, at the end of the event, we'll um, have a session of Q&A where we facilitate the questions. So I'm gonna start us off with uh, Luis, and then after that, we'll go to the movie screening, and then we'll do um, the uh, rest of the speakers. So Luis, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Maze, and it's a real uh, honor to be here. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm good, as Mays has said, I'm here in uh, both roles, really. I'm the vice chair of P Palestine Solidarity Campaign nationally, uh, but I'm also uh, a national officer of the National Education Union, which is the biggest education union in Europe. And through uh, currently and through our previous predecessor unions, we have a very long commitment uh, to solidarity with the Palestinian people. And we, uh, you know, absolutely have that as a core. So I'm going to talk a bit about both of those because I think that's quite important. And I will talk about education workers, although they're not featured in the film. I think there are certain things which uh, impact on them in the same way that uh, impacts on the wider working community within Palestine. So just a little bit about the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, because obviously we're here in the UK and we are the largest solidarity organization uh, fighting for Palestinian rights in the UK. And we do want people to get involved um, and commit to this cause. And I have to say, we continue to grow on a yearly basis. So we know that we are winning people around and our discussions help. We do a lot of 
focused work uh, in, in the UK raising the Palestinian cause and I think at the heart of what we do it is about educating people about the situation because too often people do not know what is happening they hear a very one-sided narrative uh, from our media and our government and we have to be an alternative voice we have to be the Palestinians voice because their voice rarely gets heard we have quite a significant number of campaigns. We have core campaigns that we work through, and I won't go through all of those, but they're all tied in with demands, really, that come from, from the Palestinians. So we work very closely with partners in Palestine. We want to, to work with them and be their voice um, and bring their causes here. We work with students. We work very closely with our student groups. Uh, and are very committed to try and building understanding amongst the youth uh, and younger generations um, and, and engaging them. And we also have a very strong relationship with the trade unions. Um, so the majority of the big trade unions in the UK are affiliated to Palestine Solidarity Campaign. And we have a, a coordinating body that meets regularly. Mariella attends and we talk about the work that we do, plan how we are going to continue re to raise awareness, how um, we will uh, sort of events we'll put on and how we campaign around issues. And I have to say within that committee, Unison, uh, is one of the unions that's involved in that. Unison does a huge amount of work around um, workers' rights in Palestine and have done some excellent pieces of work. So, um, so you know, they do keep, uh, keep us updated with all of the work that they are doing, particularly looking at workers in settlements that, uh, you know, that is referred to in the film. We obviously lobby parliamentarians. We do a lot of demonstrations, organising meetings, obviously everything this year had to be virtual um, but we have done a, an extraordinary extraordinary amount of work this year and heard a lot of Palestinian voices so whilst it's been sad that we haven't been able to get out to Palestine and visit um, people there we have had a lot of Palestinian voices within our meetings and virtual events this year and I think that that is really important I think people are looking forward to getting back out and demonstrating on the streets and I know we've got the Nakba day coming up and I know we're doing a lot of work building for those events uh, in our regions uh, and nationally so we um we do like to have a big um a big event and, and use those to raise awareness so you know we are very focused around those core campaigns uh, as palestine solidarity campaign just the other thing that that we do is we support trade unions in organizing delegations and that sort of takes me on to my work in our union so we take two delegations to palestine every year from the national Education Union in February and October. Um, we, our aim really is to take out people that have not visited before, education workers, to, so that they can see for themselves. So we, uh, in our union, what we have recognized over many years of doing this is that once people have seen uh, that, you know, you can never change what they have seen for them. And they, they all come back and say that, that once they've seen it, they now feel they have a duty to speak out and continue to raise awareness. And they become very, very active, not only within the trade union, but within the Palestine solidarity movement. Obviously, when we're out there, the, the main workers that we are, are meeting with are education workers. We go, we do a lot of school visits. And we, we hear from education workers, but also from students, actually, the impact of the occupation and that apartheid system, the way that they are prevented from getting to school, the numbers of checkpoints that they have to pass through, the way that they're searched and intimidated. And, you know, for anybody watching that thinks, well, you know, she's just making it up. We have seen those things happening. I have seen those things happening with my own eyes. So they are not things that I'm just... I'm just hearing somebody say and believing. They are things I have witnessed when I've been there. Um, the last time I went, when we went to Hebron, we arrived uh, to a city that was full of soldiers. We went to the school that we were visiting and there were soldiers all over the roof and in the classrooms. This was a primary school, young children um, who were absolutely terrified. Um, children in tears and, you know, very, very traumatised staff. Uh, and that is an ongoing uh, impact of the occupation. The time before I went, uh, we were in Hebron, there were soldiers firing tear gas into a playground. Several children had to be taken away in an ambulance uh, because of the tear gas and the impact that had 
the head teacher brought into his office two boxes full of tear gas canisters that have been fired in the last few weeks. You know, this is their daily lives and we have to recognise that workers are living in those con conditions and the health and stress impacts of them. Um, and obviously the wider issues in the film we see as we travel around, you know, we see how difficult it is for workers. I've been at the checkpoints in the morning when workers are queuing, queuing to get through. You see them being turned back. You see them being harassed. Um, and you hear from them about the way that they are treated when they do get through. And all of this, actually, if, you know, if the system wasn't as it was, if there wasn't an occupation, if there wasn't an apartheid system, these people would be working on their own lands. They would be doing the things that they would want to be uh, doing, growing their own crops and, um, you know, doing jobs within their own communities. But as the situation is, they are unable to do that and have to travel and put themselves in precarious conditions and often with no protection or workers rights which you hear very clearly in the film and the final thing I want to say is at the moment um, I've just started Arabic lessons but nobody's to test me because it's the very early stages of my Arabic lessons but my Arabic teacher is a woman in Gaza who is amazing and uh, so I, every Sunday morning I have an hour lesson with her and so we tend to waste a lot of my lesson talking because I'm always very interested in finding out how things are at the moment. And things are very difficult in Gaza, as I'm sure people are aware. But the thing that she spoke to me about this this very week, actually, which uh, which I hadn't quite cottoned on to, was the lack of employment, uh, particularly in Gaza. She was saying how that, you know, virtually all of the people that she knows, very well educated, all gone to university, graduated but come out and have no jobs to go to and I think you know we have to recognize that not only either workers are in very precarious work and without good safety precautions and without protection and rights or they just do not have access to work and the impact that that has long term on families and communities so, you know, I think that all of those things uh, make this a really important film and uh, will help us to spread the word even more. So in summing up, really, I would just say I watched the documentary again last night and it, it is really informative and very powerful. So absolutely well done for producing it and reflects exactly what I see and hear when I'm in Palestine. So. I really hope the audience, you know, I really hope you find it informative and please do post any questions in the chat uh, and we are looking forward to hearing back from you afterwards. Thank you very much. احنا كنا نجيب النقط في حلوق عيال بس غيرنا والله ما قدر يعني في ناس من الشغل ما أنا حتى إنهم ناموا في بيوتهم ما طلعوا في شغل سنة تشرة تخيل أنت إنسان عنده عيل وقاعد سنة تشرة الوضع مزع أول والمادة مزع أول والمواصلات مزع أول وفي ضغط عليك ضغوطات عليك وأنت ليش تطلع على الساعة أربعة من الساعة ثلاث بطلع الساعة ثلاث ليش تطلع على الساعة ثلاث أنا في الأزمات والشوارع والطرق قعدنا 90 يوم في الدار 90 يوم ما صح لناش ولا شيكل قالوا لنا شوفوا 700 شيكل ولا نزلوا 700 ولا نزلوا 800 أول شيء شغل مستمر ما فيش تقاطع في العمل يعني عندك جوا برضه الخمر والكذا والمواد اللي تجيهم صعوبه برضه يعني نروح روح ارجع لنا بعد اربع ايام ونروح ارجع لنا بعد اسبوع شو لما تشتغل يوم يومين في الاسبوع او ثلاث ايام في الاسبوع شو بدهم يعملوا لك بصراحه يعني يعني حتى نمنا جوا اشتغلنا بجوا شهرين من ضمن ثلاث اشهر الكلوشات اعطوني اياها صفر صفر تخيل يعني حتى استغلوا وضع لا اتعاب ولا 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 تامين صحي حتى دفعنا على حساب ثلاث اشهر تامين صحي هذول تخيل انت وين في استغلال كثير للعام اللي جوا بصراحه يعني كثير كثير مش شوي واللي بخليهم يستغلوا انه وفرت العمال وكثرتهم
Israel controls all the entry and exit of the territory. Uh, what that meant is that the ability for us to export and import is very, you know, obviously hampered, uh, and we buy a lot of Israeli produce, which is uh, uh, expensive. It's not cheap. So this means that the prices remain to be high, the job opportunities dwindle, the salaries dwindle, creating a massive incentive for increased uh, work in Israel and making the work in Israel to be something that, you know, there was always dependency on, but now there's much more dependency. The Oslo process enabled fast growth in Israel and then the building of the wall and then, you know, the, the closure regime uh, all these things uh, made it so that, you know, someone who, for example, used to live in the West Bank and, you know, go and work in Israel on a daily basis, now needs to get a permit, now needs to wait in line, now needs to do all these things that uh, before they didn't need to do. The occupation is a situation whereby I have, I'm going to do, it's two things. On the one hand, it's reducing the demand for labor internally by sanctioning the productive sectors like manufacturing and agriculture. On the other hand, enabling people to only be able to get to work if they get a permit to work in Israel in low-skilled jobs in the sectors that benefit Israel to get cheap, cheap labor. And that's the kind of Palestinian people that Israel wants to create. People who are just working to build Israel, effectively, uh, and don't have any other option to do otherwise. قديش بعيد بيتي عن عن شغلي أربعة خمس دقايق بالسيارة بلف الكل بلف على رمال الله وبيجي على المعبر هذا عشان ألحق الطور طيب دائما الجنود بدخلوش على السريع هنا اليوم نطلع وقفنا بالسحاب برا كم فوضى يوم يوم بتكون فوضى معدة للعمال الفلسطينيين اليوم يعني كثير كثير بيعانوا من هذه القضية ونوعا ما ما في شيء في شيء جسم يحميهم بالعربي يعني هذا باللغة بصريحة في شيء جسم كبير يحميهم عدم الوضوح في التعليمات أو اللي بنسميها اللي هي الأنظمة اللي بتحدد العلاقة بين المشغل والعامل وبين ال النقابات العمالية والمستدروت الإسرائيلي هاي بتأثر كثير على وضع العمال زي مطبخ زي مطبخ؟ زي بنات أخر مصابة كالكالية زي شغورم لأنشيم لبول ب... ولعبود بمصاب كذا إما يا في لبكيس ألبايم شيكل بخد فيوتير لا يتبع بخلا اللي بيشتغلوا داخل إسرائيل بشكل غير قانوني بيعانوا أكثر لأنه ما هم ب... هم الليجل ما بيعتقدوا هم إنه ما بنطبق عليهم القانون وبالتالي كثير بتعرضوا للنصب إذا تصاوب بتم تنكر إله وأول كلمة بقول له المشغل العام إنه كل أنت مش قانوني هوني وإذا مسكوني بحبسو بسكوك بحبسوني بحبسو بتحمل حالك وروح على الضفة الغربية تعالج في الضفة الغربية وإذا رجع الضفة الغربية صعب إنه يلتقي في مشغل أو يعطي حقوقه. العامل الإسرائيلي يوم بيدخل على مكان عمله هو في عنده نقابات قانونية في عنده كل شيء قانوني المشغل يوم بيتفق معه على مبلغ محدد الأجر بده يحول له أجره على البنك ما بيقدر يجي يعطيه كاش أو يسرق من نصه أو يقول له لا بكفيك قد أو يسجل له في قسيبة الراتب طوال بأي شكوى من المش من العامل الإسرائيلي للنقابات المهنية اللي بت اللي بتمثل العامل طوالي بيتخذوا إجراء ضد المشغل فقوة العامل الإسرائيلي بتنبع من أنه هو في عنده ممثل قانوني وكذلك الأمر المشغل الإسرائيلي ما بقدر يتعامل مع المشغل مع العامل الإسرائيلي زي العامل الفلسطيني لأنه لديه قوة أكبر من من أكبر من العامل الفلسطيني. يا مزرون. لو أبيتي سميخات مزرونين زي تبلان ده قلنا. هذا أتي. زي ما شفت كاش ما باي. زي. زي مزاي صار ما باي. مزاي صار ما باي. ما إيش بفنيم. قديم. The beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
uh, most of the cases, uh, the absolute majority of the cases, actually came from interactions inside Israel. And obviously, the population group that is continuously going in and out of, of Israel is workers in Israel. In the very beginning, uh, what we could see on videos, on social media, and so much evidence around, is that they were intentionally lax with regards to farmers and construction workers coming in and out of Israel, you know, because to them, you know, the Palestinians get COVID, uh, okay, uh, and then their economy kind of continues to be resilient. Arrangements were made with the Israeli authorities that would enable employers who can offer accommodation to their employees uh, to host them uh, for prolonged periods of the time so that they are kind of quarantined at their place of work. I mean, imagine this. Imagine that you, in order for you not to transmit your disease to uh, your loved ones, you basically have to sleep in a factory. Uh, often, and this is from videos on social media and, and, and you know, on the internet, uh, and often on the floor, <laughs> right? So these kind of conditions are, you know, obviously inhumane and are done at mass scale. يعني قطاع غزة إنه معدوم لا فيش شغل اللي بتخرج بتعلم وبتتعبي وبتخرج وبيقعد فيش شغل كله بطلات كلهم من الشباب في الشوارع يعني أنا خايف كتير على ابن على أولادي يعني كلهم خريجين أنا, ب... ب... أنا لأنه كنت معاهدة على حالي إني لازم أطلعهم كلهم متعلمين قد ما أتعب لازم يتعلموا كلهم بالواحد والحين خايف عليهم يعني كلهم بتخرجوا وبيقعدوا يعني لو لهم سمحت لهم يطلعوا برا إنه يتنوروا يشتغلوا هناك في الضفة وفي الدول الثانية في حياة فيش حياة فيش بطلات مش زي هنا مش زي بلدنا بلدنا معدومة واقتصادها البلد هذه إيش فيه فيش شغل هي بالنسبة للموضوع المرأة إنه صعب كتير يعني إلها بدها مجهود مجهود والمرأة أنت عرفتيها زي هزيلة يعني قد ما تشتغل مش زي الرجل بس هي يعني في يعني مرأة بتساعد جوزها بتساعد هذا أما كل تعب والتركيز على جهد المرأة هي اللي بتعطيها تعب يعني بتحس إنه فعلا الواحد بدت يتعب مع كبر السن برضو الواحد قد ما تكون قوية برضو مش زي أول يعني Movement um, from uh, uh, the Gaza Strip is very, very limited. Um, the rule is really that no one can travel except people who uh, uh, can do so exceptionally. And in order to cross areas crossing um, between Gaza and Israel, you need a permit. And a permit um, can only come if you meet one of very specific criteria. Israel has made a few kind of exceptions to its rule that no one can travel. One of these exceptions has been for what it calls traders um, uh, or merchants. These are people who are uh, running businesses inside of the Gaza Strip who need to purchase goods outside. And um, what we see is that something like 99% of the time, the people who are receiving these permits are men. Because Israel has defined who can get this, this permit in a very specific way, um, Palestinian women tend not to be running these major um, businesses. And so their financial needs, their economic needs, their needs for travel are completely ignored. والله الظروف المادية عندي صعبة جدا الحين الوقت الحالي مع خاصة مع كورونا لأنه فيش بيع فيش طلعة فيش قبل كنت تطلع تتعاملي مع تجار تتعاملي مع مع السوق المحلي تتعاملي مع محلات أما الحين لا فيش وقفت كل هذا وقف إلنا. Labor in Israel is construction sector which already has you know virtually very little if to no women uh, working in it uh, etc. Uh, whereas um, if you if you look at like Palestinian society and you see uh, the sectors that have actually uh, enabled women to work, these are uh, education, health, the government in general is a, is a massive employer. Jobs like working as a construction worker in Israel are not accessible to women, and so they exacerbate uh, 
uh, you know, kind of inequalities in society as well. بالفعل يعني هم مثلا لا بيشتغلوا في مصانع، اصلا عندنا قطاع غزه ما فيش فيه مصانع، المصانع الموجوده عندنا كلها بيشتغلوا فيها رجال، الشركات بيشتغلوا فيها رجال. الاسواق مثلا بيشتغلوا فيها رجال الا مناظر بتلاقي كم من ست هيك يعني لحالها بتروح مبسطه جايبه لها شويه ملابس وقاعده بتبيع فيها، في المحلات التجاريه كلها رجال محصوره عليها، المطاعم كلها رجال، السنة السياحه، الفنادق كله رجال. تمام؟ يعني وين بيشتغل النساء؟ في التعليم مدرسة وتمريض بتلاقيها ممرضة فنسبة حضور النساء يعني فرص العمل عندهم تكاد يعني أقول لك فش 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 تكافؤ بالمرة شوفي شوفي It's really important to 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 here to give a distinction between the different types of of laborers in Israel. So you have people who have a permit. So this is a permit that you apply to. Um, kind of Israeli authorities uh, to allow you to enter um, uh, Israel uh, through, you know, checkpoints. Of course, even those who do have a permit don't really have rights, if you think about it. They have some limited rights, but not full rights as an Israeli citizens would have, uh, mainly because they're not an Israeli citizen. In fact, they're not a citizen of anywhere, according to Israel. So um, their status is uh, completely up to the employer. مات نحن بجينا كانت الحياة صعبة شوي فلجأت إني أطلع من المدرسة وبلشت حياتي بالشغل مع الوالد بعدين انتقلت للمستوطنات أشتغل في منطقة المستوطنات قبل الألفين بدون تسريح كان ما بلزمش تسريح إن عشان إحنا منطقة أريحة ومن خارج أريحة إذا بدنا نطلع برا أريحة لازم نسوي تسريح بس الشغل كان المجال عملنا ده جنب أريحة اللي هو فيريد فيريد أريخو مستوطني عن طريق المعلم بيجيب لنا التسريح من البلديه بيصور صوره الهويه والمغناط وبيعمل لنا تسريح لست اشهر كل ست اشهر بجدد لنا اياه تلقائيا المنطقه اللي احنا فيها يعني بصيرش انتهاكات ولكن في بعض مناطق مناطق بعض مستوطنات اللي بالزراعه لأنه ما بأخذوا العمال حقوقهم الكاملة حقوق زي إيش مثلا زي إيش؟ يعني التعاب أو التوفير بيطلعش له كله أنت بتشتغل عندي يومية يوم في شغل بتشتغل يوم في الشغل ما بتشتغل Now there's a lot of people who don't have permits who end up doing this either by smuggling through the border or by uh, working, uh, finding like people who are smuggler or middlemen who would help them uh, do that. And the problem is with these middlemen uh, is that, uh, you know, they get a commission and it's unsafe and you don't have rights, all of that stuff. All of the payment to the laborers in Israel, those who do have a permit, who are legally there, uh, according to Israel, they get paid in cash. Something that the Palestinians have tried to change for so long and then Israel still refuses to, to change the system. Now, the problem with cash payments is so many, there's so many problems with cash payments. One of them is the lack of ability to monitor. Now, in terms of wages, you had an average salary in the West Bank uh, of around 3,000 shekels, which is like between 700 and 800 dollars uh, USD. And then, in, in, obviously, in Gaza, because of 10 years of separation from the West Bank and all of that stuff, you can say that the average salary is roughly half of that. The, the minimum wage in Israel is above 5,000 shekels, uh, which is uh, like $1,300, $1,400. The minimum wage in Israel is effectively higher than the average wage in the West Bank and, and astronomically higher <laughs> than the average wage in Gaza. People would work in Israel not simply for higher pay, uh, but also because for pay in general.
عملية التنقل للعمال الفلسطينيين هي عملية شاقة جدا. أنا يعني من خلال خبرتي العشر سنوات في خط العامل كنت ألتقي بعمال فلسطينيين لحد اليوم بلتقي فيهم، أسمع من 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 حديثهم كيف إنه العامل الفلسطيني بيضطر اللي هو نظام العمل المعروف في داخل إسرائيل في البناء، قطاع البناء هو بتبلش أو تبدأ من الساعة السابعة تنهي الساعة الرابعة. العامل الفلسطيني عشان يوصل الساعة السابعة لما كان عمله بيضطر يطلع الساعة 4 الصبح من البيت بيضطر يطلع ليش؟ لأنه هي عملية مسارك إلى مكان عملك ما هي مرتبطة في أنك تركب في السيارة وتتوجه إلى مكان عملك وما في عندك إشكالية لا أنت بدك تطلع من البيت بدك تتوجه للمعبر المعبر بدك تنتظر بدأ الفحص الأمني هناك الأعداد بدها تطلع كلياتها في الساعة واحدة بسموها الرشاوار اللي هي خلال ساعة بده يكون المعبر مفضى أنا بنحكي عن 30 و 20 ألف عامل بده يتواجدوا على معبر كم ماكنة فحص هي بدها تكون موجودة 10 12 ماكنة هذه العملية بتأخذ وقت كثير فبالتالي معظم العمال بتتواجد من ساعات الصباح الباكر على أساس تلحق أنها تطلع من المعبر للجانب الإسرائيلي ولو في مشاهدات كثيرة لو بتشوفوها يمكن أو شاهدتوها اللي هي عملية استفاف والأعداد المكتظة داخل المعابر في الأقفاص في المسارات حتى اللي بسموها هم باللغة لغة العمال بسموها المعاطات اللي هي كيف ماكنة الدجاج في الصاوي اللي كانت بسموها معاطة يعني أنت بتدخل في ماكنة بتلف هاي من مناظر يعني تكشعرها للبدان يعني بتشوف العمال كيف تكون مكتظة ومتراصة في بعض على اساس انه كل واحد بده يلحق يطلع من المعبر يمر الفحص الامني ويطلع للمعبر من المعبر على اساس يلتقي مع المشاغل ويضل طالع على شغل ويا ريت لانه في شغل في الضفة في حركة في البلد في حياة احسن من هنا تقريبا قطاع غزة منعدم بالنسبة لظروفنا هذه اما الضفة غير في انك تتواجهي عملاء يعني معاه زباين جداد دفع هناك احسن من هنا زي هيك يعني بدنا نلغي العبوديه عبوديه العامل للمشغل لانه هذه اسمها عبوديه يوم ما انت بتجبر العامل انه يرتبط في مشغل معين يضل تحت رحمته ما بقدر لا يناقشه ولا يقول له لا القسيبه الراتب انت بتكتبها غلط لا بدي اعلى بكل مش عاجبك روح روح على بيتك انا بوقف لك تصريحك بخليكش ترجع وبعدها ابحث عن مشغل اخر دور على مشغل اخر يشغلك I hope everyone um, enjoyed that. Um, thank you for everyone who stayed through and watched the documentary through. Just as a reminder, again, the documentary is called Colonial Economy, and it will be available as soon as this um, live is over um, on our YouTube channel, the PIPD Robert uh, YouTube channel. 
um, you can subscribe to it and you'll get a notification and you, you a notification you can watch it and we'll also be releasing other documentaries in the next few months um, that uh, you'll be able to also access. So with that, I hope um, you're able to take something away from the documentary about the situation that Palestinian workers are, you know, forced to work under and um, the ways in which their human rights are constantly violated and um, making a living um, is such a difficult um, task for them on a daily basis. Um, to continue the conversation, I'm gonna invite uh, Mariela Cajon to continue um, talking about um, her experience and uh, the avenues for solidarity with um, Palestinian workers. In the meantime, please do feel free to leave questions and comments so that we can uh, move on uh, at the end for a good conversation with our speakers. Mariela, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Mais, and congratulations on the film. I think it's so important to get this kind of information out. And I know from you know campaigning on other international issues and, and specifically with my background on Colombia, I know how hard it is to get you know, the reality of what's happening on the ground out to the international community. So I really do congratulate you guys on, on that film. Um, I'm really pleased to be here on behalf of the TUC and to share this panel um, with, with the sisters in Palestine and, and Louise who, who work so hard on this issue. Um, and I know there's people, you know, on the panel that have far more expertise on, you know, the situation on the ground day to day. Um, I visited Palestine once, but many years ago. Um, but we have at the TUC allocated um, Palestine as a priority for our international solidarity work. So amongst other countries where we see, you know, such a grave abuse of workers' rights, of human rights, um, we did choose, and that was supported by, you know, all our affiliates that Palestine be one of the four priority countries for international solidarity. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit from the kind of TUC perspective, how we're approaching it and some of the things that are happening with the kind of international trade union movement. I think, you know, just to say we have long-standing policy um, for many, many years at our annual Congress, um, there's been motions uh, guided by international law, by UN who's resolutions and supported by the British trade union movement um, to support uh, Palestinian rights, to oppose the occupation, um, to support um, many different um, issues um, that, I'll, that I'll go on to highlight. I think the film, you know, touches on a lot of the things I, I wanted to mention and, and touches on you know, the human side of, of the facts and figures that you hear, the numbers, but also these are human stories. As part of our efforts to try and raise awareness about the situation and, and really use the structures that we have and the influences that we have, we published a report recently called Justice for Palestine, uh, where we laid out, you know, some of our um, evidence base based on information from a lot of the organizations, some of them highlighted in the film um, from trade unions in Palestine calling for the right to collective self-determination, return and end to the occupation, um, and end to the blockade of Gaza for the permanent halt of, of any further annexation. And that report, you know, to Labour MPs around the trade union movement, both in Britain and globally. And I think it is worth noting that it's not just British unions that are concerned about Palestine. Unions around the world are looking at the situation and, and with horror, really, and trying to build more coordinated and more effective global solidarity. The International Trade Union Confederation, which represents over 200 million workers, just this month published um, a report that is called Workers' Rights in Crisis, um, about workers, particularly workers working in Israel and in, and in the settlements. And, you know, the ITUC, the International Trade Union Confederation, every year does a global survey of workers' rights around the world. And it's called the, the Global Rights Index. And Palestine is, you know, in the worst category, um, like in the in the report as the work one of the worst countries in the world for workers and and I quote they say with no guarantee of fundamental labor rights um at the the report that was just 
that was just released, I think there's several recommendations in there that touch on issues that are raised in the documentary and issues that, that Louise already touched on. Um, they talk about you know, the exploitative labour broker system. Um, they have a whole series of recommendations around improving labour rights, but also asking the, the United Nations Human Rights Council to continue to monitor and expand the list on the UN database of companies that are doing business in the settlements. Um, and that's a, a document we're using to try and identify where we can build leverage and, and campaigns on companies that are, are complicit in that process. Um, as I said, I think the film is really powerful because a lot of the time, you know, when people read figures and numbers, I think you have to put a human face to what's happening and to the suffering that people are facing. Um, and, you know, beyond the numbers, these are people living, you know, this daily reality, which I think you'll hear more from Manal and, and obviously others that can speak to it. But, you know, the, the horrifying unemployment figures, the figures in, in Gaza of unemployed, the huge levels of poverty. And to reiterate a little bit what Louise touched on, that people that are in work are employed in such precarious conditions with such long working hours, with low pay, with a lack of social protection, um, the humiliating you know, nature of accessing work itself, um, the lengthy invasive you know, security checks. And another point made in the ITUC report um, is highlighting the particular dangers faced by women workers and, and the International Labour Organization, you know, in a fact-finding mission documented checkpoints, women are particularly um, at risk and, and increased risk of, of sexual harassment. Um, and I think it's particularly poignant, given yesterday was International Workers Memorial Day, that we also recognize the dangerous jobs that workers face, even getting to work, um, that in the in the last few months of 2019, 20 construction workers were shot by Israeli soldiers as they were trying to cross the world, uh, the wall seeking employment. Um, the fact that 28 Palestinian workers lost their lives in Israeli work sites in 2019, and 17 of those on construction sites, which are notorious for the dangerous conditions. So I think it, there's so many different aspects of, of, you know, of such a complicated and, and awful situation. And I think we need to do everything we can in international community to raise awareness about this, to get this on the agenda. And um, the TUC, you know, amongst many different issues is calling on the UK government to recognize the state of Palestine. We're also calling for a suspension of the UK-Israel trade and partnership agreement, which is a rollover from the EU trade agreement. Um, obviously a, a ban on trade with the illegal settlements and enter the arms trade. And we also encourage affiliates, employers and pension funds to disinvest from and boycott the goods of companies who profit from the, the illegal settlements and, and the occupation. Um, and also look at how, as I said, we can use, you know, information around companies to try and build pressure um, on companies. So we're working in a variety of areas. I think, you know, I, I want to also acknowledge the unions that affiliate to TUC, the, the fantastic work that they're doing. Louise already spoke about the National Education Union, Unison, Unite. There's many, many different unions from many sectors that really are um, very committed to this issue and I pay tribute to them. Um, and really most importantly, pay tribute to the workers, um, men and women um, in Palestine and children who are working under such difficult conditions um, and showing such bravery. And I hope you, you know, know that there's many, many people around the world in solidarity with you and standing with you. And um, I hope this film gets seen as much as possible because it really is important to keep highlighting these issues. So thank you again for the invitation and thank you to, to PIPD and to PSC for organizing the event. Great, thank you so much, Mariella. You brought up such important um, points, especially about, you know, the context of um, how in, in which all of this is happening, which is, you know, support to businesses that fund uh, settlements, that fund the occupation and apartheid system, contribute um, to the root of the cause and to the issue, and that, uh, you know, lead to these conditions that Palestinians are working in. And to add to what you're saying, you know, um, I think in the documentary, Zane, which we introduced, talks about this. Um, he says that, you know, 
it's not only the conditions, but it's what sort of jobs are even on the market for Palestinians. You know, there's a great discrepancy between the types of jobs that a Palestinian can hold, uh, especially in Israel and Israeli settlements, versus, um, you know, what is available to other um, Israeli Jewish citizens that are, you know, more tertiaries, um, sort of higher um, earning jobs, uh, which, uh, which is very important to highlight. Um, so thanks, Mariella. We can return back to these points as we um, get back to the Q&A sessions for now. Manal, uh, I think I'll um, open the floor to you um, to sort of tell us more about your um, perspective and your context. Thanks a lot, uh, Mace. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to, uh, to have me speaking in this event. Um, the, the documentary is really great and um, it perfectly highlights the, uh, the dire working conditions and the ill treatment that um, Palestinian workers at Israeli corporations uh, encounter. And what adds insult to, to injury is, is how difficult um, it is to unionize the, the workers and organize them so that they can uh, demand their rights. And this is one of the challenges faced by uh, the Palestine Federation of uh, Trade Unions. And there are different reasons uh, for that. The first reason is um, there is no Palestinian trade union is uh, allowed to, uh, to visit the workers and communicate with the workers uh, at the workplace because uh, as part, it is part of, um, of the apartheid and the colonial situation we live in because Palestinian presents in certain places like in Israel or in the settlements or in Jerusalem where the workers work is criminalized. And uh, if we really even try to, uh, to access these places, we, we will risk losing our lives. So that is one of the challenges and it is hard to, for the new unions to go and other Palestinian trade unions to go and document the human rights violations that take place at the workplace. This does not mean that it is difficult to, or it is impossible to, to unionize workers. Uh, no, rather, I mean, I mean uh, the, the new unions has succeeded so far since it was uh, created in 2010 to unionize 15,000 workers. But the process is really difficult compared to uh, how the, an Israeli trade union would be easily able to uh, unionize workers just because it is an Israeli trade union. And we, a few days ago, we celebrated the victory of, um, of an agreement signed between more than uh, between more than 70 Palestinian workers uh, and their Israeli employer at the factory of uh, Yamis in, in the uh, illegal settlement industrial zone of Nitzani Shalom, located in, in Tulkar. Um, after uh, a 20 uh, days of an open-ended strike, followed by uh, three months of negotiations led by the new unions. And uh, of course, uh, during the strike and even uh, during the negotiations, we got huge support from trade unions and, uh, and friends of Palestine around the world, which we are thankful to because we reached this victory through them and, th and through our work uh, on the ground. <clears throat> And the other reason why uh, it is hard to, to unionize uh, Palestinian workers uh, lies in the fact that there is fear, there is tremendous fear instilled inside the workers where they themselves are afraid to, to organize and demand their rights. And if we want to trace why they are, uh, these workers are, um, are uh, intimidated to ask for for their rights or for the equality at the workplace as their Israeli uh, counterparts, we should look into uh, the Israeli permit system um, as a disciplining tool. The Israeli permit system, which is also highlighted in, uh, in the video, but I want to speak more about the process. I mean, uh, Palestinian mm -hmm. workers are being disciplined by the system even before they officially uh, become uh, eligible to work uh, legally in, uh, in Israel because it's a complicated process to get a permit uh, to go to work. And uh, there are restrictions. Uh, I mean, Israelis say that uh, um, only married workers can get a permit, but many of these married workers cannot get a permit. This is because uh, the Israelis claim for security reasons, because when a worker apply for a permit, 
um, the Israeli uh, authorities, they trace the history of that person and the history of their families. And if they found that they were involved in any actions, even nonviolent actions against the Israeli occupation, they, uh, they reject issuing them permits. Uh, and uh, so this process, when, when it is really hard to get a permit, instills in the workers uh, the fear uh, that I just want to work. I don't want to demand rights. For those who have permits, they think of uh, of the future. That if I might, if I protest and ask for my rights, uh, they might reject renewing my permit in the future. Um, and uh, many others. I mean, the, the majority or the rest of the workers, they don't have work permits uh, to work at Israeli corporations, so they smuggle to their workplace at. Um, yeah, to their workplace, and it is a precarious journey uh, because uh, we, usually Israeli soldiers catch them, they beat them, sometimes they start shooting at them. And since the, the start of 2021, we lost three workers uh, who were smuggling to their workplace, uh, at, in, uh, I mean, to, to their destination of work. Uh, either in Israel or in the settlements. Um, and these workers, because of the precarious journey, they prefer or they are forced to sleep in the workplace and their Israeli employers do not provide them with human-like uh, conditions to, to sleep or to stay in after work. So they are forced to sleep in, in greenhouses. They are forced to sleep in, uh, in buildings under construction. And these workers, like demanding their rights or any of their rights is for them out of the question because Israeli employers uh, can easily uh, fire them without giving them any of their rights because they are classified uh, illegal. So these workers do not demand or ask for uh, their rights. Um, another level of disciplining the worker is that not just about demanding their rights, it's about the fear of speaking uh, about what they encounter. And here, when I saw the, the worker that was captured in, uh, in the documentary speaking, uh, the worker who works in a settlement near Jericho, uh, who, who was speaking that he doesn't encounter uh, like uh, exploitation, but other workers do. I'm not here assuming that he encounters uh, human rights violations, but he wants to hide that because he's afraid. But uh, when I saw him, there are certain issues that came to my mind, and I think it's important to highlight them. Uh, first, uh, that a lot of the workers uh, always are afraid, are always afraid, many of them are always afraid to say uh, what what they really encounter. So they either stay silent, and if someone asks them, they they don't say that they uh, they face any uh, dire working conditions. The second issue is that the different levels of oppression and exploitation each worker encounters makes normalizes the exploitation of workers. So every worker starts comparing himself or herself to the other worker. Oh, I my my working conditions are much better than the other worker. But this does not mean that. Uh, the working conditions are really uh, important or as they should be. So there is, the normal becomes abnormal. There is normalization of, um, of the exploitation. Uh, and uh, the third issue is, uh, is that even if, uh, if Palestinians, let's just imagine that Palestinians are treated like their Israeli counterparts at the workplace. This is not what we want. And this is not what the, uh, the Palestine Federation of Trade Unions uh, seeks to uh, to achieve because uh, because it's not about being treated uh, equally as Israeli workers. It's about not working uh, for Israelis and not working at Israeli corporations uh, uh, in the first place. We want to reach a point where we're not forced to work uh, to work there. And this moment uh, and this moment is the moment of liberation and decolonization because uh, the new unions believes that. Uh, our struggle is is uh, is an anti-colonial struggle. Uh, it's not just a, a class struggle. Um, if I have more time, I do I have? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would like to speak about um, like different forms of exploitation that uh, are related to children. Uh, for the greedy Israeli employers, uh, despite the fact that adults get exploited. It, for them, it's not enough to maximize their profits. So they want more people. And here they, they target children to exploit, uh, especially in the agricultural reforms in the uh, farms, sorry, in the Jordan Valley. Uh, these children really like encounter horrible 
horrible working conditions, um, especially those who work uh, in the palm uh, farms. Uh, I mean, Israeli um, Israeli employers prefer children to uh, to pick the the dates on top of them palm trees because it's easier and faster uh, and this is why we find a lot of children working in that industry uh, so so Palestinian children in these palm uh, farms they 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 are the, like the chimney sweepers of of the 21st century uh, and they are they get underpaid they work for uh, long hours it's usually hot when they work and they don't uh, are not provided with any protection they don't have uh, health insurance, uh, and they get injured. Uh, when they get injured, they don't get treatment by the Israeli employers, and they get injured a lot. Especially, uh, they get bitten by uh, the snakes, uh, which are on the top of uh, of the palm trees. Um, yeah, so, uh, campaigns like the Palestine Solidarity Campaign in the UK against uh, Israeli uh, dates is, is really something uh, important, and it's, it's really something we uh, we encourage. Uh, because this is part of the accountability and this part of ending the impunity of Israeli apartheid regime at the macro level and uh, Israeli apartheid regime at the micro level where the children are exploited uh, at the workplace. Uh, I just one last thing that I wanted to say is that uh, supporting the BDS is, is really important and this part of, uh, of the struggle of workers and this is why the new unions uh, fully adopts the, call, uh, the, the BDS call for uh, for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Uh, and I wanted also to emphasize that the BDS has united both Palestinians and the solidarity uh, efforts around one main goal, which is to dismantle Israeli three third system of apartheid, settler colonialism, uh, and occupation. Uh, and it is also uh, the BDS also speaks to the um, to the struggles or to uh, to anti racism uh, or to anti racist sorry anti colonial and anti homophobic uh, struggles uh, around the world and um, uh, this is why um, it has uh, succeeded in globalizing the struggle of the oppressed and the systematically uh, marginalized uh, people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manal. That was very insightful and I think um, gives a lot of context to the actual experiences on the ground and sort of what trade unions, you know, in Palestine, uh, especially and across the world, but in Palestine, you know, the, the aim isn't only to reform, um, but to, you know, it's not simply to say, you know, let's pay both equal, but to really get at the root of uh, the issue of apartheid and occupation that um, sets all of this up. Um, we got a few questions, so if the speakers are comfortable, I'm going to move on um, to share some of the questions for the audience. If you still have any questions, please do send them through. Um, but I will start with a question from Ron um, Mendel, and he asked, um, do Palestinians who live and work in Israel have any rights that migrants from the West Bank don't? Um, and have the former groups of workers organized unions? Um, so sort of comparing Palestinians who work in Israel um, versus those who work in the West Bank. Um, if any of the speakers, anybody wants to jump in, please go ahead. I can um, uh, answer this question, but I just want uh, to get clarification. So they want a comparison between Palestinians who work in Israel and Palestinians who work in the West Bank. For, for Palestinian employers, right? Yes, I believe so. Um, and okay. So um, employers everywhere um, want, want one main goal, which is to maximize their profits. So exploitation exists everywhere, even, uh, even for um, Palestinians and even is, uh, I, I mean, even Palestinian employers exploit um, exploit workers. Um, the situation is a bit different or there is like major difference between uh, what is happening in, in the West Bank uh, at Palestinian corporations and uh, in Israel at Israeli corporations because uh, there is exploitation. Uh, that is something that we, we try to, uh, to fight back against as a trade union. 
Um, and it's easier because it's easy to go, it's easy to document human rights violations, and maybe this is something that makes it easier to, uh, uh, to work with workers and try to defend their rights. Uh, the problem is uh, that the legislations related to, to workers in the West Bank, I, I, I mean the, uh, the Palestinian authorities and the labor rights uh, for Palestinians, and the Ministry of Labor and its, uh, its laws, they uh, the, the problem is that there are no mechanisms to, to enforce any of the laws that, uh, that ensure that workers are treated, uh, treated in, in an equal or in, in, a, in a human way. For instance, that the minimum wage in Palestine is supposed to be um, 1,400 shekels, which is about um, not $350, something like this. Um, and the, many of them are uh, are being paid below that the minimum wage in, in in Palestine, and there is no way to force employers, Palestinian employers, to um, in order to uh, to force them to to pay the workers uh, according to uh, to the minimum wage, and most of the time uh, they don't get punished or. Uh, held accountable, so there is a certain kind of impunity, and it has to do with uh, with the legal system in Palestine. It's a really complicated process if workers want to go to court in order to demand uh, their rights, and this is one of the problems that we face. But in general, uh, what also Palestinians in the West Bank uh, face uh, is also part of the colonial situation. I mean, we 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 Israel impose, has imposed on us a new a new liberal system. And neoliberalism is reflected in every aspect of uh, uh, of our lives, um, and uh, and workers in the West Bank get uh, affected by uh, by this like neoliberal uh, system and the whole uh, economic situation and how there are certain people uh, who who have a lot of money and who uh, and who exploit the few who exploit the many. You see. Yeah, so, so that's maybe the major difference. And regarding those who work in Israel, I think I've highlighted like most of, uh, um, of the major issues and in addition to what you, you also uh, shed light on in, in the documentary, these generally what Palestinians at Israeli corporations encounter. Thank you. Thanks, Manal. And yeah, I think uh, the question also asks if um, Palestinians who work in Israel have managed to unionize or um, how successful such uh, unionization could even be. Um, I think this is an important question because in the documentary, we also talk about how even the, um, the context doesn't even allow them to fully um, advocate for their rights because they are um, so sort of replaceable or the legal system doesn't really protect them per se. Um, so I don't know if you want to touch on that, um, if Luis and Mariella also want to talk about that. Okay, shall I talk about this? Yes, um, thank you. Thank you. I, um, as I said, unionization is not easy uh, for the different reasons I mentioned, but um, it's happening, it takes place, but it's very slow, it's very complicated. And sometimes uh, it needs um, a lot of effort to, uh, to raise awareness among these workers in order to unionize. So the new, what the new unions usually does is, okay, we're not allowed to access uh, workers at their workplace to get to know them more, to unionize them, to, to raise awareness of their rights. But what we usually do is that we go to workers at the checkpoints. You know, um, every day, like thousands or more than 20,000 workers wait at, um, Israeli military checkpoints to uh, before passing to their workplace at Israeli corporation. So that's a place where we talk to, uh, to workers. That's a place where we get to know more about their situations and they get to know more about us. And it's also a place where we build trust because trust is the beginning of convincing uh, workers. So it's it's uh, the precondition to convince the workers uh, that they need to, uh, to unionize, that um, they need to, uh, to trust us and uh, in order to support them. So that's how it, how it happens. 
I mean, there are different trade unions in Palestine, but I'm more aware of, uh, of what the, the new unions does. Um, so yeah, that's all about uh, unionization. I hope that I answered the question. You did, yes, thank you, Manal. And if there are any follow-ups and we have time for it, uh, we can come back to it. Um, I think uh, sort of a question maybe Luis and Mariela, you can also chime in on is um, for, you know, audience watching who wanna be more involved um, in unions in their own uh, countries outside of Palestine, what's the space um, to, um, you know, create some action, create solidarity? And um, what's your experience been um, a little bit? Um, do you, I mean, I can come in on that to start with. I mean, obviously we have quite um, a long commitment and involvement as the National Education Union and finally the National Union of Teachers. And I, I think our core really for getting people involved is our delegation visits. Um, but I think anybody that's in a trade union, you can't, the first thing that you can do is go to, go to your trade union branch and ask for them to invite a speaker from the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and start a discussion uh, about the situation. Mo as I say, most unions are affiliated to PSC nationally and that, you know, therefore branches uh, of unions up and down the country can affiliate, can have a speaker from Palestine Solidarity Campaign. They can find their local Palestine Solidarity Campaign branch. So we've got a network of branches up and down the country. Lots of uh, our members in the National Education Union are also involved in um, in their local branches and organizing events that way. So, you know, for example, I'm involved in our Nottingham branch. We are in the process of organizing a Nakba Day demonstration in our city center. We've got a stall at our May Day event on Saturday because we're now able to stop getting out and doing things. So we've got a stall, we'll be out talking to people. And we have found that's a really good way of raising awareness and involving people um, in, it, you know, in what we are doing. So that's, I think it is about just opening up the conversations. If you're interested in it, you know, the majority of unions, as I say, are absolutely committed to this cause. So I think if you raise it locally, you will get backing. Um, and obviously, I think as well, once unions can start reorganizing delegations, getting yourself booked on to a delegation so that you can, you, you know, you can get out and visit and see the situation for yourself, because for sure, when you come back, you will be an absolute advocate and out there speaking out about what you have seen. Absolutely. Thank you, Louise. And I think, um, Mariella, maybe you can also share with us a little bit about your experience um, unionizing. And I believe in Colombia, you said, correct? Um, you've had some experience there. Um, yeah, I used to run a campaign that was set up by the British and then Irish trade unions to support um, human rights and trade union rights in Colombia. Obviously a very different situation and different context, but it's the country where most trade unionists are, are murdered in the world. So the, the British trade unions have also given a lot of support to that campaign. And then I was working in the peace negotiations and the peace process so I think obviously situations are very different and very unique but I think there are you know common threads about the importance of the international community focusing on these issues and um, the you know common thread around sometimes the lack of um, you know proper reporting about what's happening on the ground and also um, trying to get space you know in the international agenda and in the media about what's happening so I think there's common themes there in terms of you know the importance of campaigning the importance of the trade union movement and I think the trade union movement as one of the biggest you know democratic international movements has a real role to play in raising these issues up the agenda um and and bringing people together from very different realities but you know I think one unique thing the trade union movement has is that we have relationships with workers all around the world in, in many of the places that are facing such difficult abuses so I guess you know my experience on Colombia is that it really was the support of international community and the trade union movement that that has made a difference and I think um hopefully you know we can build 
I think there's a lot of solidarity with, with Palestine. A lot of people are aware about the situation, but I'd echo Louise's point about delegations. I haven't been on, on a similar delegation type to Palestine, but I, you know, we did take hundreds of, of trade unionists and MPs to Colombia to see the situation on the ground. And I do think seeing that firsthand reality is really important. Um, obviously not everyone has the opportunity to go, but that's why I think these kinds of films and also giving a platform to people like yourselves who are living there, who are experiencing it, who know about the, the reality, trying to open up that space as much as possible is, is really important. Yes, absolutely, Mariela, I agree. And I think um, there is a lot of space online now, especially as we're moving to more digital work and co uh, collaborations for people to um, join events like this or join petition, sign petitions, uh, advocate through social media, um, et cetera, that can create more connections than ever before. Um, so before we wrap up, we have one last question um, and it's about perhaps the most extreme situation in Palestine, which is Gaza. Um, people in Gaza, we had a question asking, can workers in Gaza ever apply to work in the West Bank? Um, and um, I think that's a very important question. Um, do any of the panelists want to volunteer to answer? Manal, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, well, the question is impossible. It's impossible for um, for Palestinian in Gaza to apply for uh, for a job in, in in the West Bank because people in Gaza are living in an open air prison, and an open air prison means that they are not allowed to step out of the Gaza Strip. There are checkpoints um, everywhere between between Gaza and the West Bank. Uh, where work, where people uh, cannot move. I mean, there are certain uh, like kinds of exceptions, but they are just very, very limited exceptions. Um, so yeah, the, the, and uh, and the the blockade on Gaza. Part of the blockade is to impose a, an economic blockade on Gaza. It's I mean, it's part of a systematic uh, a, a process. Um, carried out by Israel, which is not to allow them to work, you know, to, to, let, to let them sink in more and more poverty, uh, and to make their situation as dire as, as they can. So, uh, and not allowing them to come to the West Bank and work there is, 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 one of these, uh, is one of these measures. I mean, people who want to get treatment in the West Bank sometimes, or many of them get rejected. How about those who want to work? Of course, they are not allowed to work, unfortunately. Thank you. Absolutely. I think, you know, the um, the situation in Gaza is um, very difficult. And as you said, Manal, to even get basic treatment permits to leave um, for emergency situations are often denied. And, um, you know, it truly is an open air prison. And it, actually, in another upcoming documentary PIPDs produced we talk about the ID system and the extent to which these different IDs, you know, the West Bank, Gaza, and then, uh, pa you know, Palestinian refugees, and then you have Palestinians living in um, inside the Green Line, really restricts the mobility and the ability to access different economic resources. And that in and of itself creates such pressure and um, such dire situations under which Palestinians live in fragmentation. Um, so, you know, I think somebody mentioned this earlier, you have somebody in Gaza and then someone in the West Bank and someone in the West Bank isn't getting their basic rights, but they think, you know, it's not so bad because someone in Gaza is even, you know, denied even more, um, is living under even more oppression. So this is such an important point to make. Um, and thank you to whoever raised the question. Um, I think this is all we have for today. I'm so grateful for the conversation that we got to make. So grateful for everybody who joined in and stayed till the end of the conversation and watched the whole documentary through. Again, it'll be available online to watch. Um, please uh, do um, share it with your community um, and please do uh, join groups like PSC UK and PIPD and other trade unions who are already um, doing all of this work and have been for so long and um, elevate their voices 
um, more and uh, elevate the voices of workers that are oppressed globally and in Palestine. Um, if we have nothing to add, um, speakers, I think uh, we'll wrap up here. And thanks again for everyone's time. Have a great evening or day or morning, everyone. <laughs>